Good to see you. Thank you uh, for being here at Grace Bible Church. So I want to start off our time together this morning uh, asking a question, okay? Don't answer out loud, okay? Uh, you can raise your hand. I, I think that'd be kind of cool if you, if you want to raise your hand to this question. Is being busy a sin? If you think being busy is a sin, raise your hand. There's a couple. Yeah, yeah, Okay. So if you think being busy is not a sin, raise your hand. Okay, some of you, your arms aren't working. Okay, you need to wake up. All right, so, so it's kind of a trick question, really. Uh, you know, we're, we're entering into the holiday season, 
and it's the busiest time of year for a lot of people. Uh, in fact, uh, even this morning, walking around, greeting folks, talking to them, uh, it was a common theme. Everybody's talking about how, how busy they are, and I get it. Uh, it, it, is, it is a busy time. Uh, but uh, I, I just I want to relieve your minds, okay? First of all, being busy is not a sin, okay? So a lot of us, we're doing okay, aren't we? <laughs> we got one thing down. We got one thing we're doing well. Uh, being busy is not a sin. But there is a caveat to that, okay? There's a caveat. And the caveat is this. As long as we're not busy doing the wrong things, okay? If we're busy doing the wrong things, then, then busyness is a problem in our life. However, if we are busy about the right things, being busy is actually, we're doing actually what God created us to do. And, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And uh, being, being this time of year, a lot of us struggle uh, with being busy. But, uh, but again, being busy is not the problem. The problem is being busy with the right things. And so how do we know if we're being busy with the right things? How do we know if we're chasing the right agenda in our life? Because there's a lot of agendas. And, and if you don't have an agenda, there's a boatloads of people trying to get you on their agenda to pursue what they're pursuing. So how can we possibly know when we are busy with the right things? Jesus had some things to say about this. And before we answer the question of how do we know if, if we're busy with the right things, Jesus approached it from the opposite angle. He approached it saying, here's how you know when you're busy with the wrong things. He, he starts from there. He said, let's, let's talk about what life feels like if you're busy with the wrong things. And then he offers, this is what this is the way to be busy with the right things. And so we're going we're gonna to follow along with what he says in Matthew chapter 6. Because we're talking about for the next several weeks of how do we create space for God in our life. And again, I really wrestle with that, okay? Because you don't create space for God in your life. Okay, that's, that's a terminology we use to try to explain what we're doing. But, but God in our life is like breathing. We, we breathe without ever thinking about it. And in fact, if you're thinking about breathing, generally something's wrong. Right? I mean, the only time we ever think about breathing is when we're having trouble breathing. And unfortunately, for many of us, when it comes to our relationship with the Almighty God, it works the same way. The only time we think about it is when there's a problem. Because he's engaged in every part of our life. So we don't really create space for him. He's all around us. He's active in your life right now. Whether you acknowledge it, whether you and I recognize it, he is very engaged in our lives. So really the question is, how do we become aware of him in our life? And maybe that's the tagline that I should have used for uh, this particular sermon series. Instead of creating space for God, maybe it should have been, how do we become aware of God? Because He's very active in our lives. And we're very busy. And if we're busy with the wrong things, He explains, well, this is what your life is going to feel like. And He did this in Matthew chapter 6. It's part of Sermon on the Mount. And notice what Jesus says. He says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear, is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? So immediately what this is telling us is that Jesus is saying, when we're chasing the wrong things, we are going to experience anxiety and worry in our life. 
In fact, they, they almost go hand in hand. If, if you and I find ourselves worrying about something, we're anxious, whether that be something in our family, something at work, something of financial, something in a relationship, if we find ourselves being worried and anxious as, as if it's on us, I've got, I've got to figure this out. I've got to pull this together. I've got to... F- that, that lets us know immediately we're we're off center we're off center we're we're not we're not we're not leaning on Christ we're not we're not keeping Christ at the center of life anymore we've we've gone off center when we start feeling a lot of worry and a lot of anxiety i love what jesus asked can any one of us by worrying add a single hour to our lives not only does worry not add to our life worry sucks life out of us it sucks life out of us and that's the first observation worry sucks the life out of us by filling our minds with anxious thoughts do you know what the word worry means here when he's talking about worry it's it's strangle that's what the word Originally, it's, it's a strangling. It, it is the idea of being pulled in different directions. And when we feel that way, life is not energized. It is sucked out of us. It's, so so it, worry doesn't add one thing. It only takes away. It only, it only takes away. Jesus goes on to say, And why do you worry about clothes see how the flowers of the field grow they do not labor or spin yet i tell you that not even solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these if that is how god clothes the grass of the field which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into fire will he not much more clothe you you of little faith so do not worry saying what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear for the pagans run after all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them here's here's the phrase that stands out to me when i read that he says the pagan the pagans run after all these things i think that could be the tagline for many of our lives running after all these things now, I get it. When we read this passage, uh, most of us sitting here, we're not worried about the next meal. We're not worried about the clothes we're wearing. We, I mean, our basic necessities for the vast majority of us sitting here and for watching online, our basic necessities are taken care of. Yet, we find so much to worry about. And we find so much to run after. And it fills our life up. And, and we're chasing these things. Jesus is talking about, you know, you, you have a heavenly father that's going to take care of you. And, and if you're chasing something that has, that's creating worry and anxiety inside of you, if, if we are living our lives in such a way that we can't enjoy the care of the Father because we are anxious and worried about what we don't have or what we think we should have or the problems that we're worried are not going to get taken care of, as if God has, as, as if God has looked at you and said, you know why, you are on your own. Go figure it out. Good luck! If we're living that way, it means you and I have lost track of what we should be chasing in life. That's what Jesus is talking about. This is proof of being busy with the wrong things. You see, worry sucks the life out of us by fueling the activities that we do with anxiety. Let me ask you a question. How many things do you think we do in life because we would we worry if we don't do it? So what we're actually doing is being fueled by the worry and the anxiety in our life, which is exactly what he's talking about. These these the, he calls them pagans run after all these things. Their worry is actually their fuel. And it's, and it's sucking life out of them. It's not producing life. 
Not only, not only are they not experiencing life, they're losing life, and they're not, they're not engaged in life-giving things. You see, there are life-giving activities, and there are life-sucking activities. And you and I, when we are aware of God, we're aware of Christ, we stand a much better chance of plugging into the activities that are life-giving. They're life-giving activities, not only to us, but the people that we're around. We're engaged with. So I want us to think for a little bit today on the secret to a worry-free day. Now, when I was putting this together, at first I thought about a worry-free life. That is completely unattainable. All right? And I knew if I said that, that would be like, oh, he is blowing us a bunch of smoke. You can have a worry-free day. And the, and the goal is to connect as many of those days together as we can. As we seek the Lord. And in fact, that's the key to it. That's the key to creating space for God. That's the key to being aware of God's activity, God's movement in our lives. It is to seek Him because look at what Jesus said after He's talked about worry, after He's talked about how it does nothing to add to our lives, it only takes from us. Notice what He says, verse 33. But seek first the kingdom, His kingdom and His righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. So He spends a lot of time talking about what a life feels like that's chasing the wrong things he spends quite a bit of time saying this is what it's going to feel like if you're chasing all the wrong stuff but here's how you get here's how you get on the right agenda seek his kingdom and his righteousness first and then all the other things will take care of themselves that almost sounds too simplistic, doesn't it? It almost sounds like, oh, that may have worked in Middle Eastern Palestine when there were no cars and there were no internet and there was no politics. Well, you know what? There was no internet, but there was politics and people still moved around and there were still problems in the world and there were things that they had to take care of and the details of their lives were different than our details, but the principle's the same. That if we seek Him first, His kingdom, His righteousness first, then everything else will take care of itself in its proper place, in its proper time, and we will spend the proper amount of energy on it because we're seeking Him first. So, two things about a worry-free day. First of all, seeking God first creates a worry-free day, not a busy-free day. This is huge. Being worry-free doesn't mean that we're not busy-free. In fact, we have been called to be busy for the Lord, to be working for Him. In the context of our lives, with the skills and the personality, the job that He's given you, the family that you have, the people that you run with, all of this, God is in all of it. God is in that lousy job you have. God is in that frustrating family you're a part of. God, God is in the midst of the bad decisions that were made that financially have you strapped. He is a part of all of that. He's in it. But if, but if we will seek Him first, it doesn't mean that our busyness goes away. It just means that all of a sudden we're busy with the right things. 
And the Bible talks about this. Look at what Jesus said. Jesus said in Luke chapter 10, he said, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. Think about that for just a moment. If the harvest is great and the workers are few, those few workers are going to be working more, not less. Do you see what I'm saying? We're, we're supposed to be busy with the right things. Don't confuse not having worry in your life with the idea that I don't have to be doing anything. No, it's we're to be busy with the right things and pursuing the right stuff. But here's the thing. Each worker must defend decide for themselves what harvest they're trying to bring in because the harvest really is great in a lot of different fields right i mean there's the career field there's the education field there's the i want to be popular field there's the i'm seeking a relationship field there's 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 these things all these different slices of our life that that we pursue and chase and and we want them to come together we want it all to fit together isn't that right we want it all to work together and each field is calling for the worker to come and work in that field and jesus says you know what if you'll work in my field first if you'll work there you'd be surprised how all these other fields will fall into place. But how do we choose? Because each of us must choose. I, I do not doubt, I mean, I know young people, when I, you know, I, I'm primarily talking to, you know, adults in the room, but you know what, our young people are very busy. I'm talking about our students. Oh, they are so busy. But guess what? It's because we take them there. They, they don't get there unless we take them. And that becomes part of our busyness too, right? You know, oh, now, now I've got this, this little kid, and I want them to have all these experiences as if seeking the Lord first would rob them of something. Oh, they're not going to have that if I seek God first. They're not going to have that experience. Well, yeah, we got to choose. We got to choose what field we're going to harvest. Some fields create worry. Others just create good work, doing the right thing. Look at Ephesians five. It says, "So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise." And by the way, I didn't call you a fool. Okay, that's what the Bible said. I didn't say it. We're just reading scripture. Be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. We would agree with that, right? Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. See, we get to choose. He didn't make us work in his field. He didn't make us go to work for him. We get to choose. And so it becomes our responsibility to understand what he wants us to do. And do we do, we do this? Do we understand what the Lord... Do you, know, do you know what the Lord wants you to do at work? Do you know what he wants you to do there? I mean, you probably have a good idea of what you want to do there, what you're trying to accomplish there, but do you understand what the Lord wants you to do there? Those that are students in the room, do you know why? Do you know what you, the Lord wants you to do at school? I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure you think you know what you should be doing at school, but do you understand what the Lord wants you to do at school? What about in your marriage? Do you, know what the, do, do you understand what the Lord wants you to do in your marriage? What about finances? Do, do you and I, do we understand what God wants us to do in our finances? What about our calendars? 
You know, we, we open up our calendar, we plan our day. Do we understand what the Lord wants us to do with our calendars? This is what it means to seek the Lord. I mean, I could even say, do you understand what the Lord wants you to do here in this place? Engaged at Grace Bible Church. Do you and I, do we understand what the Lord wants us to do here? You see, if we don't understand what we're supposed to do, then we will just do without understanding. And Jesus says, when you and I fill our lives up chasing the wrong, wrong agendas, we are going to experience a lot of worry and anxiety. We're, that, that's just a byproduct of chasing the wrong things. The other thing that, that, that I would like to point out is that seeking God first creates a worry-free day, not a comfort-filled day. Because this is big. Because, you know, a lot of us think that if I could just take care... A, a worry-free life would be a life that is completely comfortable like I want it. Right? I mean, if I've got everything I want, what do I need to worry about? And so what we, what we begin to do is think that, well, you know what, if, if, if I'm not worrying, that must mean I'm not busy. If I'm, if I'm not worrying, that must mean that I have everything that I want and my life is exactly how I want it to be. That, that's not what that means. That's not what that means. A worry-free day doesn't mean we're going to necessarily have a comfortable day. He said, well, why? why? Why can't it be both ways? Well, Romans 8 tells us, For God knew His people in advance, and He chose them to become like His Son. We've talked about this uh, for the last several weeks. It's popped up in other things. And it, God is way more concerned about our character than He is our comforts. And, and, so, and so here's the thing. When, we, when we're talking about our character, we're talking about what motivates us. Why do we do what we do? And it's not just our motivation, but, but beyond that, it, it turns into our attitudes. Why, why do we think the way we think about the world? What do we, and, 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 and then, and then it obviously it boils down into how do we treat other people? See, that's what God cares about. He, he cares about who we are as people way more than he cares about what we actually do. In fact, I would dare say that God cares more about why we do something than he cares about what we actually do. And we, we turn that around. We really focus on the doing and don't even think about why we're doing it. And that's how our lives get off track. And then all of a sudden we're worried about things that we shouldn't even be chasing because we haven't thought about why am I even doing that in the first place. Why is that such a concern to me? Why do I feel like my life is going to be less if that agenda is not fulfilled? Those are questions we don't think about. In our life, it, it gets off track and, and we become unaware of God in our life and we, we still believe in Him. We, I mean, not all of us sitting here, those of us watching online, none of us would dare stand up and say, I don't even believe in God anymore. I mean, you're here. You believe in Him. But that doesn't mean we're ever thinking about Him or ever looking for Him and what's going on in our life. He's just another slice over here, and, and, and we think about Him like we do breathing when there's a problem. Now, now I, need to get back. I need to get back to Him because there's a problem. When he's involved in everything. He's involved in everything. You see, those, I, I just want to tell you, those who, who seek the kingdom of God first, they, they, they will not experience the comforts that other people will experience when they're seeking other things. But I can also tell you, they won't experience the worries. And that's what Jesus is talking about. That, that's what he's trying to explain to me and to you. So here becomes the next question. How do we know? How do we know when we are seeking God first? And Jesus tells us in this little phrase. He tells us the answer to how you and I can know if we're seeking God first. 
And it really boils down to two things. First of all, we can know we're seeking God first if we remain teachable. If we remain teachable. He starts off by saying, remember he does this whole, he does this long speech about worry and how it doesn't help you and you're chasing the wrong things and it takes away from your life. And then he says, but, but those who seek the, his kingdom first, those who, what? Seek. Those who are seeking are teachable. The people who are no longer seeking think they got it figured out. I mean, what else is there to look for? I know exactly what I'm doing. I know exactly what my life should be like, what it should be about. Well, if you know exactly what it should be like, why are you so worried about it? See, they kind of work against each other. Now, his kingdom uh, basically is in everything, okay? His kingdom is both present and future. Uh, The kingdom of God is at work in our lives today, and the kingdom of God is something that will be established in the future. So, I mean, that's a whole other sermon for a whole other time. But basically, when he's saying those who seek his kingdom, we are looking. That means God's active, his kingdom is involved in every area of my life. And I need to be looking in that area and join him. I need to join him there. I need to seek him out. I need to learn what God is trying to do in that slice of my life. Is this making sense? So, think about it like this. Our, this will be a good one. This will wake you up. Are you teachable in your politics? Yeah, right? Oh, no, I know exactly. I got that figured out. Thank you. Well, then why are we worried about so much about what's going on? See, see where is God is in politics? He's engaged in all of that. Our job is not to pick a party. Our job is to seek his kingdom. We seek his kingdom in that and join him there. That's what, that's what it means to seek the kingdom of God. Oh, no, no, no. I got that figured out. I know, I know what I think when it comes to those things. I know I'm absolutely right about all of my blue views and all of my red views. I got it all figured out. I know what it should be and what it should not be. That's called pride. And you are no longer teachable. And you're not seeking God any longer. And what God is doing in that area of our life. I could pick a dozen other things where we think we know what we should be doing, but, but we're not teachable there anymore. We're not seeking God there anymore. A lot of people are that way with their finances. They don't seek God's kingdom in their finances. They got it. And they also worry about it. See, it goes hand in hand. Where you and I remain teachable, it means that we are seeking out what God wants. Uh, I came across this verse a couple of weeks ago while I was on vacation, and it's become one of my favorites. I don't know why I've never noticed it before. 1 Corinthians 8, 2. Maybe because I was full of pride. I bet that had part, probably was part of it. I'm pretty sure. Look at what 1 Corinthians 8, 2 says. Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know. Wow. Wow. Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know. We become proud, we become unteachable, we think we know. And Christ is no longer the center of our life. We're no longer seeking His kingdom. Because we know. We know. And this verse explains the position of an unteachable person. It explains that position of someone who says, you know what, I don't really need to pray about that. I already know. Really? Interesting. You already know.
if a person remains unteachable, then they're no longer seeking the Lord. Look at what Matthew Jesus said in Matthew 23. He says, but those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Let me, let me explain how, how this works. We have two options. We can be humble or we can be humiliated. That's, that's the only two options we have. And, and we remain humble by seeking the kingdom of God in all areas. God, in this area of my life, what are you trying to do? I need to join you in my career. I need to join you in my education. I need to join you in my finances. I need to join you in my marriage. I need to join you in my parenting. God, what are you doing in this slice of my life? That's how we become aware of God's activity in our world. We look at the whole slate and say, I know nothing, Lord. I'm assuming you know something I don't know, so show me where you are. And that's how we remain teachable. If we're not like that, James 4, 6 says, God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. You see, God opposes people who are not teachable. The people who say, you know what, I don't really need to pray about that. I don't really need to seek God in that. I got it under control. I know what I'm doing. God says, all right. I'm not going to force myself on you. In fact, I'll just make it a little harder for you. And the outcome of that is worry. He didn't create the worry. He didn't do that. It's just the consequence of leaving him out. I, I don't have this down, okay? I, I don't, I, I'm still learning this too. It is so easy to wake up and think, well, I know what I need to do. I know how I need to handle that. I, I understand. I don't have this figured out. But, but here's what I know. I can't find one good reason to not seek Him first in every area of my life. And I know for me personally that when I, when I fail to do that, when I stop striving to do that, that I get off track. And, and, and Christ is no longer the center. And I'm busy running after all these things. And I think that happens to a lot of us. The other thing that happens when, when we know, one way that we know that we're, that we're keeping Christ at the center of our lives, that we're aware, that we're creating space for Him, if we want to say it that way, not, not only are, are we remaining teachable, but we are quick to repent. We are quick to repent. He says in Matthew 6, 33, that, that those, he says, but, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. So his kingdom, we've already talked about. What is his righteousness? His righteousness is, is this is the way God wants us to act. This is, this is the way God wants us to think and act. And, and when you and I come into a position where we realize we're not thinking and we're not acting as, as Christ would have us to think and act, what should our response be? Repent. I'm seeking that out. I'm seeking His righteousness. I, I want to be right with God more than anything, more than feeling comfortable, more than, more than, than making somebody else feel good. Not that I'm out trying to hurt other people, but, but I want to be right with God first and foremost. And if there's something in my life, that in, in my thinking or in my behaving that is not right, I want to repent. I, so, so what does that mean? What does that mean to repent? It means that we turn away from the sin and we turn back to God. It's, it's doing a 180. I'm, I'm walking in sin. I'm thinking in sin. Oh, I'm aware of it. I want to be different. I turn. I repent of that. Now, God, I'm seeking your righteousness. I want to walk in your righteousness. This is how we know that Christ is at the center of our life. And this whole thing of repentance, we, we stink at it. 
we, including me, we stink at the idea of repentance. Because we are terrified of humbling ourselves before the Lord, humbling ourselves before others, because we are terrified that they're going to know about our sins. Clue, we already know about them. You're aware of my sins. I'm aware of your sins. Maybe not all of my sins, but the ones, because listen, it comes out. Selfishness comes out. Pride comes out. Greed comes out. Laziness, it comes out. It all comes out. Everybody else sees it. So why don't you and I just admit it to ourselves and repent? We struggle with repentance. Job 34, 33. Look at this question. This is a question one of Job's friends asked him. He said, should God then reward you on your terms when you refuse to repent? That's a question we should ask ourselves. Because here's what a lot of us do. We live our life without seeking his kingdom, without seeking his righteousness, but we still believe in him. We're not, we're not seeking his kingdom, we're not seeking his righteousness, but we would never deny him. So what we do is we, is we charge ahead in our life and, and we hope that God will bless it. I mean, it's not, it's not really what God wants me to be doing. It's not really what God has asked me to do. But I'm going to charge ahead in this career. I'm going to charge ahead in this educational effort. I'm going to charge ahead in the way I'm handling my marriage and my finances. I, I'm just going to charge ahead. Oh, and God, bless me. Bless me as I go. Help me. And Job's friend asked, Should God then reward you on your terms when you refuse to repent? The prophet Jeremiah, he was speaking uh, on behalf of the Lord to a, a group of people whose hearts were hardened towards the Lord. People who believed in God, but their hearts were hard towards God. And notice what what he said, he said, none of them repent of their wickedness, saying, what have I done? Each person pursues their own course like a horse charging into battle. This is the attitude of many religious people. We just charge ahead. I'm, all, I, I'm in the right fight. I'm in a good fight. This is what I should be fighting for. I'm charging ahead. But yet we are not seeking His kingdom. We are not seeking His righteousness. We are not repenting of our sins. This is the attitude that many of us have. Look at what he says in Ezekiel. Ezekiel the prophet said, therefore I will judge, God speaking through the prophet, said, therefore I will judge each of you according to your own ways, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent, turn away from all your offenses, then sin will not be your downfall. Get a new heart and a new spirit, for I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent and live. You see, sin is the downfall of many people. And it is because we will not repent of them. We just charge ahead. We just charge ahead in our pride and our arrogance and our and our overconfidence and and, and these things. We just it'll all work out. Because you know what? I believe in God. I go to church every once in a while. Heck, I even give a little money every once in a while. It'll all work out. And sin becomes our downfall. It crushes us. So we can be humble or we can be humiliated. Part of being humble is this idea of repenting of our sins. Saying, God, I'm wrong in this. I'm wrong. Look at what Acts 3.19 says. Now repent of your sins and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. Then times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord. That's a worry-free day. 
But it comes to those who are seeking His kingdom and seeking His righteousness. They've made that a priority. They're looking at it in every area of their life and they're saying, where are you, God, in my marriage? First of all, I'm seeking you there. Let me tell you what's going to happen when you seek Him there first. He is going to point out your selfishness in that relationship. And you know what you need to do when that happens? What's next? Repent! And then times of refreshment will come within your marriage. I just saved your marriage. <laughs> I, I know it's not that simple. But the principles apply. And it, and it works. It works. If we will seek His kingdom, seek His righteousness, times of refreshment will come. That word refreshment, it means relief. It means relaxation from the presence of the Lord. That means a personal encounter with the living Spirit of God. And that creates a worry-free day. Doesn't mean it's going to be a busy-free day. Doesn't mean it's going to be a comfort-filled day. But it will be a worry-free day. Let me ask you some questions before we leave or just make some comments. See, we know we are seeking God first if we're teachable and if we're quick to repent. But we know we're teachable and quick to repent if we're experiencing less and less worry in our life. When's the last time you had a worry-free day? When's the last time you had that? When was the last time you were certain Christ was at the center of your life? He was at the center. You weren't leaving Him out of anything. Let me ask you, are you certain Christ is in your life? Are you certain you have a relationship with Him? Because that's where it starts. You can't seek Him and His righteousness without first knowing Him. So this morning, as we get ready to leave, if, you would, if you're uncertain as to whether you know Christ or not, Pastor Jason is going to be waiting right up here when we dismiss in just a moment. If you would like to know more about inviting Christ into your life. He'll be waiting there to pray with you and speak with you. But we have to humble ourselves and go there. We have to do that. And so I'm going I'm to lead us in a closing prayer. And, and, then, and then we're done. It's, a, it's the prayer for this week. And it's a little homework to it. So it's not really, we're not really praying right now. This is something I would challenge you to do later. But notice what the prayer says. It says, Father, I will be teachable. I will be teachable. I humble myself before you. Show me where your kingdom is actively accomplishing your purposes in the different areas of my life. And then I want you to specifically name an area. Like your work. Like your marriage. Like parenting your kids. Like your politics. <laughs> name, name an area. God, where are you working here? I want to join you here. I would suggest you start with the place you worry about the most. Say, I will be teachable there. I will humble myself there. And then as you, as you pray about that, continue to pray. I will put your kingdom first and learn what I need to do to cooperate with you. I repent of my sins. Then name them. Don't. There is no general forgiveness. There's only specific forgiveness. We must specifically name our sins. And he will specifically forgive those sins. Then continue, don't let my sins be my downfall. Send me times of relief and relaxation from the worries of my life. Let me have a personal encounter with your spirit. 
I ask it in Jesus' name. Listen, if you would like more information, if you're online this morning, you want more information about a relationship with Christ, I encourage you to text the word CONNECT to that number, 330-400-2869. That would open up a line of communication. If you're here in this room this morning, you'd like to know more about a relationship with Christ, Pastor Jason's waiting right there. Please do that today. God bless you. Thank you for being at Grace. We will see you here next Sunday. Thank you for joining us on GBC Online. I am so grateful that you're taking advantage of our ability to be able to broadcast our services over the internet. Thank you for joining us. I know that this is the busiest time of year as we move into our holiday season. But you know what? If it weren't for Jesus, we wouldn't be busy with this at all. He really is the reason for the season. But it's hard to keep him at the center of, of our celebrations uh, because we get so busy doing other things. But you know, here at Grace Bible Church, we really desire uh, for you to hear from Christ and be able to respond to Him. And as you spend time with us, and, and if you would like to make a decision for Christ, if you would like to talk about what it means to keep Christ at the center of your life, how to make it all fit through this holiday season, well, we would really like to hear from you. The best way to do that is to text the word CONNECT to 330-400-2869. You can also call the church office or you can email us through our website. All of that is a great way to get in touch with us. We would love to talk to you about Jesus and keeping all of it together through this holiday season. God bless you. Have a great week.